If I can have your attention, please. Per usual at this point, the doors to the hotel's conference room have been closed, and from here on out, the wait staff will no longer enter the room as we listen to our speaker, as well as when he leaves and we have our discussion afterwards. I hope you all had a nice lunch. Refills for coffee, tea, and cold beverages are on the side table. I'd like to welcome you again to another meeting of the California Cold Case Society. You all bring considerable experience and knowledge to your fields of criminal detection, profiling, records research, and forensics, as well as some creative branches in the areas of movie and TV consultation, art, writing, and I'm told even a true crime book or two is in the works. Being retired helps us devote a little more time to our interests, which in turn makes us more well-rounded. I have personally vetted our guest today, Mr. Stephen Strong. He has a clean record and a broad knowledge of mid-20th century California cases. The Black Dahlia is for him one of several interests. However, Elizabeth Short's cold case from 1947 Los Angeles is the one he has studied the most. If you've been waiting to hear a take that is new and unusual, if you've been waiting for something that may open up some new directions for us to brainstorm and peer into, I think you are going to want to hear what he has to say. We've all studied the case at length ourselves, including the various suspects put forth, none of whom we've found satisfactory. I've told Mr. Strong we have a number of ongoing investigations. If we agree to pursue some new areas of investigation, it will be done quietly, and more importantly, no report from us will be made public without including him as a resource. He has never before today spoken of his theories to anyone, including the media, just me, and after careful consideration, I invited him to speak to us. While what you're about to hear today is a new direction, we all remember that if it wasn't for the West Coast motorcycle historian who brought to us the leads on the Lucinda Meredith Aiken case, we would have never gone in the directions we did, which helped to ultimately solve that cold case. Just so we are all clear, I've informed Mr. Strong that when he is finished with his presentation, he will leave the building and we will discuss his finding amongst ourselves. If we as individuals with our various means and skill sets are able to find and corroborate new leads based upon his presentation, we will include them in our ongoing investigation presenting law enforcement with our findings through established open channels. He has agreed to wait for our answer before going public. So without further ado, I yield the podium to Mr. Stephen Strong. Thank you for having me. There is no finer group of people I would want to make my presentation to. The Black Dahlia is a solvable case even after all these years. We all know a myth didn't kill her, a real man did, but this man had a terrible interest in myths which should have been discovered sooner. The Black Dahlia was a mermaid, a fish. Yes, you heard me correctly. Or should I say, was the Black Dahlia a mermaid, a fish? Of course, not literally a mermaid, but was she made to look like one by the killer? If you want to take a moment to say, what the hell is wrong with you, Strong? Do so now. I expect I'll get some of that, and jokes, and bitterness at the very idea, even though all those terrifying wounds, both on and through the victim's flesh, continue to be a completely open question without adequate explanation. For those interested in a new take on the case, I'm hoping you will give me a chance to explain what I think was going on. In time, some of you might begin to agree that it is at least plausible and there is nothing wrong with taking it under consideration. That's all. No one pursuing other leads or writing books need feel that their slice of the pie is threatened. 
I've no book to publish, no agent telling me to get the backing of someone famous for a cover quote. Oh, and the killer wasn't my father either. As for those who may ask how and when did this new hypothesis begin, all I can say is that certain aspects of the case have been working on me for a long time. I haven't gone all Robert Graysmith as portrayed by Jake Gyllenhaal in the movie Zodiac, but I've done my fair share of reading and listening to others. Outside of law enforcement, and we have no idea what the active Los Angeles investigators have been up to, if anything. So again, outside of law enforcement, which includes me, there exists by us and for us the realm of nonfiction books, websites, discussion boards, commentaries, and documentaries. In that realm of open-to-anyone investigation and reporting, the case has been stalled for decades and there has been a level of thinking that is tied down to a certain class of suspects that, in my opinion, is a bit too conventional. Conventional as in, the killer was just a guy who was mad at her. The murder of Elizabeth Short is not conventional or in any way reasonable, which makes the type of offender who did it harder to understand than most of the differing suspects that researchers have put forward. The killing was drawn out and was of an extremely personal nature. Even though the body was left in a public place, the unknown suspect, the unsub as they are called, did not want certain aspects understood, which may have pointed back to him. I believe this offender was far more sick, damaged, fetishistic, and on the brink of insanity than has been previously understood. His perversions were off the chart, and so were his hatreds. He dropped a mutilated corpse atom bomb on Norton Avenue in Los Angeles and wanted those who saw what he did to her to suffer psychological fallout sickness. He put her there in full view to say, you didn't stop it, so you are all equally to blame which also helped him shift responsibility. The washed body, which could have been buried or put in the ocean, was placed openly as a confident, hate-filled statement by the offender right up in the face of law enforcement and the psychiatric community that they would have no idea who the torture killer was or how to find him. He felt so sure of his undetectability and complete lack of any known previous connection to the victim that, after she was ID'd so quickly, he made a phone call and returned some of her belongings, giving him great pleasure that his unusual murder, which he had long fantasized about, was gaining publicity. And yet despite his accomplishment, his worsening emotional state would be much harder for him to deal with than the ease he had in disposing the body. Then he was gone, but I don't believe without a trace unless he managed to erase his personal effects and created a new identity. Barring that, his name can still be found. As for those in regular society, the almost unfathomable crime with unique signatures visited upon the body, mocks and tarnishes every ideal and sense of justice that we collectively hold. No one should get away with that. We ask, who are you? What are you? If we get a better idea of the what, we get a better idea of the who, and we get a better idea of both from the cruelly transformed body of the victim. Elizabeth Short was cosplay in blood. Cosplay as a term didn't exist then, but costumes and fetish was alive and well. You may be asking, you mean he wanted us to see her as a mermaid? No, I do not believe we were meant to make the connection. It was a fetish-derived lust murder, but the clues were just too diabolical. We know the photos, 
but have those who have stared at the crime scene and autopsy photos with their own eyes, have they really stopped to think of another human being doing those things to an immobilized woman in real time and what he was thinking, what needs he was fulfilling from such blood-soaked transformation? The Spanish Inquisition is better understood than this one mutilated corpse. The case spins off in a thousand different directions because it's as though people think it could have been done by anyone or any lust murderer whose blade work had no other reason than to make her suffer for suffering's sake, as though the killer himself was a lofty, intellectual, impersonal, high-born inquisitor who stood apart from his work. Someone like that could have even directed another to inflict the pain if punishment was the only motivation. Bear with me on this, someone simply very angry that she wouldn't have sex with him or jealous after a breakup just doesn't fit. There are many cases like that, but not like this. The Black Dahlia killing was unique. Therefore, it was undertaken by a unique offender who is not interested in normal sex. Okay, I know that right now you are wondering about the mermaid aspect. One, since it has never been put forward before, and two, unfortunately there can be a cute factor to many depictions of mermaids that in a context such as this is repulsive, let's say, to those who do not want their favorite myth or fairy tale sullied. I understand, especially concerning the direction we are headed, which is absolutely horrific and not for the faint of heart. Please accept, however, that mermaid depictions and fantasies can also be very adult. A mermaid is both a siren that lures men to their deaths or is a sexy, willing sea nymph and object of lust, swimming about and there for the taking. First, then, let me ask, what is a woman from the waist up, especially an attractive young woman from the waist up, in maritime culture and storybook lore all around the world. A mermaid. What kind of woman is half fish? A mermaid. What kind of mouths do many fish have? Long, wide mouths. What kind of teeth do many fish have? Sharp teeth. Are you beginning to see in discussing the case, people sometimes bring up the Glasgow smile for torn open cheeks. But is there another reference? Yes, in some forms of rough, bloody fighting, it was or is called fish hooking. However, while the offender could have torn her cheeks, instead they were cut with a knife, not torn. So in her case, the look is more fish-like. Moving on. What kind of reproduction organs do mermaids have? Unknown, which means it is completely open to one's personal thoughts on the matter, though I think if we were to place them on a solid, leg-free lower torso with a large fin, sex organs in the front seems the most reasonable. More questions. What is a trident? A three-pronged spear used in spear fishing. In classical literature, a trident was the weapon used by Poseidon or Neptune, the god of the sea. What is a four-pronged spear? It is one used in spear fishing to catch large fish. Would that particular set of Los Angeles streets where the body was left on Norton Avenue with a convenient empty lot have attracted the killer for its outlines on a map? Could someone really have carved a real girl into a mermaid? Naturally, we fight the idea that anyone could be so bizarre as to make a woman look like a real mermaid, cut in half from the waist up with a horrible fish mouth. If a part of you is feeling ill at ease, it may be that it's not entirely my reconsideration of the wounds. It's the cutting of the body by someone with specific horrid intentions, regardless of my view. 
Again, the body placement in the open was meant to traumatize people, though most of us would never have seen the photos had they not gone from person to person and from books to websites. But here we are. As our mutilation spins in the backs of our minds, we are incensed that someone did these things to this poor girl and literally dehumanized her. He turned her into an object, a female myth, a fish woman with a wide fish mouth on a human face. He used for pleasure a subhuman fish woman with an equally subhuman front-facing sex organ before he bisected her. He did things to her skin and body for personal satisfaction, and I'm pretty sure he added some extras to throw the police off. When he was finished, he cut the fish in half to signify what she was to him and just how badly he wanted to see a real semi-human or even non-human fantasy object. He, of course, did not have to think of himself as one who killed a real girl. She became a mermaid, and mermaids aren't real. No doubt he even told her that, and even more cruelly, told his dying victim that mermaids, according to legend, do not have eternal souls. In the hours before he disposed of the body, he bisected her, drained the blood, and washed her. But he wasn't done. He added fantasy props to the upper body, such as placing a mirror and a comb in her hands to signify a mermaid's vanity. He created the lower half of a mermaid with a tail, taking photos. He didn't have to use a realistic rubber mermaid half-body. He could have used paper, cardboard, netting, or even fabric bunched up into shape for his photos. There is more to the cutting and mutilation, and we'll get back to that. I think there are explanations that, while horrible and as newly proposed as the rest, will contribute to a new understanding, which I must emphasize had absolutely nothing to do with modern art movements of the time. Those movements developed in the first half of the 20th century were far too sophisticated and nuanced for this killer, who had much more lowbrow working-class tastes, as in commercial art, tattoos, fantasy costumes, carnival freak shows, wax museums, themed displays in department stores, drug stores, and world fairs, sometimes with real women, book and magazine illustrations, motion picture serials, pinup art, taxidermy, and mythology. That doesn't mean the art he liked wasn't well done or that there was anything wrong with it in the normal context for which it was created. However, again, this was popular art and was not conceived as or considered modern art. Every man who becomes a murderer starts out as a boy. A greater understanding of the offender is where we must go. At this juncture, I must also ask, what is a sexual fetish? It is an arousal to an object or a body part that is not typically sexual. It is something the fetishist cannot do without or won't do without given an opportunity to completely have their way. A heterosexual fetishist of a certain bent desires a human female in a sexual capacity, but not necessarily to be completely human. Her body to him as a fetish-derived fantasy object and a thing he can control is much more important than her humanity or willingness to participate. For this reason, prior to attempting the Black Dahlia murder, the offender would have sought satisfaction on lesser representations as part of an evolving, developing fantasy through paraphilia. I'm going to describe this person and what may have been going on with him long before the murder. Not everything may be true. In fact, that is a given. Even the most expert profilers with years of experience 
may not describe everything to a T, and every new hypothesis has its downsides because it is not refined by the evidence that the police may have but that we may not see. That said, I'm going to present this as a whole, even though I know I could qualify everything I describe as possibly, in some way, maybe, somewhat, and more or less. I'm sure your own skeptical minds will fill in as necessary, as well you should, but don't worry. I'm not going to attempt to persuade you with old theories such as the McDonald Triad. What I am attempting to explain may be taken in a theatrical sense as background character development, if you will, as in an exploration of the offender's possible experiences and subjective desires, rather than to actually try and pretend this is on the level of a trained criminal profiler like some of you in this room. I am aware of the descriptive words and categories that are used, particularly by Douglas and Walter, but I would hate to accidentally use those phrases in ways not intended for the general use by the investigators who designed them through long and difficult years in the field, interviewing convicts and reviewing crime scene evidence. Obviously, any established concept on criminal psychology and terminology can apply and be useful to others but I don't even consider myself an amateur sleuth. That is, one who can direct you at this point to a suspect with a name. I've filled in my own blanks on the suspect because I'm concerned that the traditionally understood Black Dahlia guesswork has not resulted in identifying a truly convincing suspect in all of the studies and has stymied the case with distortions of a supervillain especially by one author who, in order to convince people, he from the very start exaggerated nearly everything he wrote in order to get them to go along. He even da Vinci coded the misunderstood surrealism art movement with a tremendously self-serving definition as something that advocated violence against women based on an exceedingly small portion of surrealist works depicting compartmentalized or partially hidden bodies, a motif suggested by André Breton in the Surrealist Manifesto of 1924 when he described a creative vision of seeing a man and a perpendicular window, a divided man, as it were, without any particular meaning. The Dahlia author and a follower who wrote a Another book got it all wrong, just terribly wrong, and it left an impact on people who knew almost nothing of surrealism. This self-referential author's meta take on the case as a big insider kiss-up to an artist friend, as well as naming the suspect the Zodiac and a serial killer in other famous cases over several decades, can be assessed for what it is stupidity moving the case away from the lowlife that did it toward wealthy evil geniuses that command people's imaginations as kind of cool real big daddies with the money power and knowledge of city corruption in order to pull it off leaving the police afraid to bust them and the da afraid to bring them to trial well you know that's nonsense like all depraved murderers, this offender did not have the city and county of Los Angeles in his pocket, and he didn't have a son who would write about him someday. Aside from that, there are fine people behind a host of theories and suspects. They actually make the 1940s era and who is who much, much clearer to those of us paying attention to them, while at the same time they have brought to light facts and reports that tend to cast doubt on some of the other suspects. It's muddied and frustrating, but at least the researchers of time, place, and suspects have kept the story alive in Elizabeth's memory. Like they say, it's a jungle out there. Yet in this case, I would characterize it more of a moonlit lagoon where mermaids play and bottom-feeding monsters dwell in the deep. 
Now let's look at our unknown offender's early life and how he ended up creating a real mermaid. To any other group, I'd apologize if the following impressions of the offender seem sick and weird, but I've been assured that sick and weird is what you do. Of course, the first thing some people will say, if I were to go public, is that it says more about me than the offender. While it's not true, the comment directed at, say, crime authors usually stems from a general lack of knowledge of the strange obsessions of some criminals who do horrible things. Before I begin, I think I should quote profiler John Douglas from his book, Journey into Darkness, Chapter 2, which begins, I've often said that what we do in analyzing a murder, that what any good homicide detective does, is very similar to what a good actor does in preparing for a role. We both come to a scene, in the actor's case, a scene in a play or movie script, in ours, a murder scene, we look at what's there on the surface, written dialogue between the characters or evidence of a violent crime, and we try to figure out what that tells us. Okay, that was John's words. You perhaps have not heard it put quite that way before, but actors, in a sense, profile the characters they play, and obviously novelists do the same thing when they write characters. An actor carries within him or herself a well of the character's background experiences and feelings. To gain an understanding of the character, he asks, what do I want? What is my objective? How do I get it? What stands in my way? The foundation of those questions is, who am I? As we will see, nature and nurture is where we must dive in order to begin to understand a person that would cut a woman in half. Now, having opened a can of worms and suggesting the Black Dahlia was the offender's mermaid fantasy girl objective, I've developed a background as to this type of offender, starting with his early life. The boy's growth was stunted, and he had a minor orthopedic problem, a birth defect or injury. It did not impair his physical sexual development, but nevertheless he was uncomfortable with it and he wished to keep it hidden. He believed himself to be damaged and unloved. This was reinforced by the beatings he received. He was not close to his parents and was frightened by their loud arguments. His father was often away for weeks, if not months at a time, with the marital relationship ultimately ending in separation. The boy blamed his mother for pushing his father away he found an interest in myths and legends, the powerful and the monstrous, witches, wizards, kings, robots, aliens, freaks, and the half-human animals created either by science or magic, seeking out library books and magazines with pictures. He looked at taxidermy books and stole pictures from them. He suffered abuse, sometimes even sadistic sexual abuse by a family friend or relative who gave him alcohol to sedate him. As he reached puberty, he started borrowing women's underwear as props to use on bedding, carefully returning it afterward so as not to get caught. Paraphilia was strong with this one as objects became arousing. He had not been naturally interested in dolls until he used a large one that was a grown-up and womanly with smooth satin clothes, a boudoir doll that some women keep on their made-up beds as a decoration. If that wasn't available, ordinary pillows and shaped bedding was enough, but then he turned to a younger sibling at times as an inanimate object, whom he told to be quiet. It didn't matter if it was a brother or sister because he was creating a fantasy. He did not penetrate or hurt them, but used them by rubbing, also known as fraterism. He placed paper cups found at water coolers under the victim's shirt or whatever was on hand to create the shape he wanted to look at and hold. The shapes and the fantasy created the excitement, not the lower body because he was pretending the body was an older girl or woman. At times he was furious at the thought that his mother was outside the door listening or even watching for her own pleasure. 
yet on one last occasion she burst in demanding to know what he was doing. She punished him and later mocked him at times, saying things like, I know all about boys like you, and then abused him in some way for herself, saying, Is this what you want? She also found some of his fantasy pictures and tore them in half in front of him, which not only infuriated him, but caused him to feel intense loyalty to his interests. He hated her and thought of the different torture devices he had seen in books and magazines that he believed she was fit for. He became interested in medieval torture devices and thought up new ones. He liked the powerful executioners who chopped off heads and whipped prisoners. He liked people who made weapons and all kinds of criminal devices and infernal machines, even those devices people created for suicide, with a particular fascination for guillotine-like devices or illusions. He began to wonder what it would feel like to kill someone and thought about the different ways it could be done. He tortured insects, rodents, and reptiles, even created small death arenas and mazes in which he could kill them with fire, nail, sticks, and glass. He was no less unkind to fish, frogs, and crawdads, thinking up the most unusual ways to watch them die. His teen years went on and he thought often of movie monsters and mad scientists capturing women, tying them up and doing things he fantasized about. Vampires became very exciting and he wanted to cut flesh and drink blood with them, even telling himself that he was a vampire, but fearful that he could not get away with it like Dracula, because when he tried to hypnotize a girl, it hadn't worked. He started peeping in windows and having violent rape fantasies about specific young women he would see around the area where he lived or riding streetcars. He watched them and followed some home. He entered homes for the sole purpose of looking at women's underwear, sometimes cutting them there or stealing those he found outside on the clotheslines and cutting them later. His first real girlfriend was someone he tried to love romantically. He was nice to her and he paid her way on dates, but she was at times cold to him around other boys. He asked her why and she told him the other boys are taller and she liked tall boys. He realized he was being used until someone better came along, which angered him. The relationship didn't last. He continued to make pictures of women being experimented on in dungeons and on prison ships, thinking of capturing mermaids as well as creating other mythological creatures like obedient vampire girls and ruling over stitched together zombie women. At some point he was caught by the police in the course of his activities and was sent to a juvenile facility or an institution where, like many youths, he was badly mistreated and suffered sexual abuse by a male. He never forgot the conditions of his release, having been told, you do this for me and I'll do this for you. He was very, very angry that he had been made to live in fear and suffer humiliation. Once on the outside, his sex fantasies continued. His fantasies of reimagined women were more exciting to him than real females. There was a fetish aspect to what he liked, and having tried a normal relationship, it just didn't do it for him. In the juvenile facility, he hated being told he was sick. In order to get out sooner, he apologized and said he was sick and he really wanted to get better. In reality, he didn't want to get better at all, and he was more at ease with his illustrations collage, pillows, blankets, and applied textures that turned him on, silk, leather, and animal skins. He worked in the fishing industry, cutting and chopping fish through shift after shift. He worked with an older man who talked about sex constantly, allowing him the freedom to speak himself about sex and grafted female fantasies of women and animals. 
The older guy bragged a lot and gave him tips about women, homemade sex devices, and sexual deviancy. Some of the offender's activities continued to be dangerous for him, but he learned how to get away with things. He enjoyed working with the cutting instruments and when alone, tasted the blood of different animals and fish. During the war, he worked with the injured and the dead, becoming familiar with every type of open cavity wound there was to see, learning strange things about the human body and the spine. He got into some serious trouble holding on to skeletal remains and was made to speak with a psychiatrist. He was found unfit and was discharged. His drinking, smoking, and coffee consumption increased, leaving him at times through stimulant psychosis to wonder what was real. After the war, he preyed upon the weak, stealing from drunks and mugging others. He bit a woman at a dance hall and was chased out. He raped a woman he found working alone on a night shift. He abducted Elizabeth Short, who was destitute and looking for a meal and a place to stay. Being that he perceived himself shorter than average, upon finding out her name, he really hated her for that. At the same time, her beauty inflamed his desires and so he determined that he would turn her into his fantasy object and kill her. While many assumed she was tied to a bed, the offender took her to a shuttered workplace that he had access to and tied her to a table. He began with her on her stomach. He made her say things at first, like she loved him, she hated her mother, and that she was an animal, even that she was a little stupid fish who wanted to get caught, but also that she was a vain, man-destroying mermaid that called him to her in order to kill him. He struck her without an ounce of sympathy, saying it was all her fault. Tied up, she resisted saying the things he wanted, and so he hurt her with a pointed object and or cigarettes, which he was chain-smoking and getting high from. Turning her over on her back, and again tying her wrists and ankles to the table legs beneath the tabletop, he then forced her to drink alcohol. He was through hearing her cry, speak, beg, and interrupt his fantasy by trying to negotiate a way out. He did not want to hear her say anything. He just wanted to make her his fantasy. He fed her fish food, brownish, greenish, granular material that has never been identified, but that was found in her stomach. He cut a slit on top of her pelvis and did it on top, causing unspeakable pain. All he cared about was his pleasure and his power over her. He wanted his mermaid and he wanted her to pass out. He didn't mind that she was in pain, but he wasn't creating pain for pain's sake the whole time. Everything was a means to an end involving his fantasies. He wanted to taste her blood. He got very close to her skin. He made himself very comfortable laying next to her with his face up close. He cross-hatched her thigh with shallow cuts and tasted the fresh blood as he was cutting. He was in ecstasy watching the droplets emerge and savoring her blood. He continued to refer to her as his mermaid and cut into her upper lip with lines resembling sharp teeth. He tasted her blood from each fresh cut. He loved the mermaid but hated the girl named Short. He hit her about the head trying to knock her out or kill her so she wouldn't move. He told her he really meant it when he told her she would be his fish girl and so he cut the sides of her face to give her a fish mouth. He watched her die and then chopped or cut her in half to finish the look. He didn't have to be a trained surgeon to do that. Have you ever seen expertly sliced fish? It's perfect. Knowing what he knew about the human spine, he bisected her where he did. Or he got lucky, cutting between L3 and L4 vertebrae. Lots of criminals get lucky 
on the most maddening of details. He washed her using a shower head connected to a hose and cleaned the body with a coconut fibered brush from the tropics. He put props on her, a homemade tiara on her head, a mirror in her hand, and something he assembled to look like the lower half of a mermaid's body with a tail. He took photos, which of course only he would develop and see. He also wanted to misdirect the police because even with the props removed, he really still saw a mermaid and feared they would see it too. So he made some other cuts, taking some skin but leaving some inside her. That had no meaning to him personally other than further humiliating her as an aside, but he believed the investigators would be so confused by it that they would place a high meaning on it. What mattered most to him was his fantasies and his personal gratification. She was his catch, and so with perverse humor, he dumped the body on Norton Avenue because of the empty lot and the fishing spear shape he saw on the map. Any empty lot would have been acceptable, but this one had the added benefit of no people around at night and yet the likelihood that someone would come along and see it the next day. He wanted to read about it, not wait ten years for the skeleton to be found somewhere. He may not have been able to resist leaving something else that he felt sure would not be understood by the investigators. Maybe it was fish food, but it was too degraded in the stomach to be identified. There was other material in the stomach of an even more controversial nature, and its presence may have been better understood by modern forensics. In any case, the killer felt the secret of her body was safely hidden because while he saw a sexy fantasy, everyone else would see a hideous monstrosity that defied understanding. Again, some may someday say this appraisal of the killer tells you more about me than it does about him, as though no one is capable of using their knowledge and imagination to create a picture of the killer. What I've described as a fetish-fueled lust murder should not seem as strange as it sounds because this type of offender exists, and while rare and not the same type of a killer, there really was a Jack the Ripper too, whose reasons for cutting into the flesh of his victims has not been agreed upon. He would take his needs far beyond normal murder, especially the last Whitechapel victim, Mary Jane Kelly, when he was alone in a room with her and took his time. The Black Dahlia body is so unique and bizarre that only a unique and a bizarre reassessment will do, but it was not art per se. It was the creation and fulfillment of an other-than-human fantasy. Where do we go from here? Perhaps the offender was put in jail for some related sexual activities or was put in an insane asylum as he broke under the strain. What's more, with the fantasy and mermaid model, there is opportunity for finding many odd things from the time that could link a suspect. For instance, Norton Avenue. Aside from what I said about or including the fishing spear configuration of the streets, was there an author named Norton that the offender might have known and read? How about the science fiction and fantasy novelist Andre Norton, who was first published in 1934? Her real name was Alice Mary Norton. She was later published by Fantasy Publishing Company Incorporated of Los Angeles, which was founded by William L. Crawford, an early supporter of H.P. Lovecraft. In December 1946, Forrest J. Ackerman became his partner. Yes, the Forrest J. Ackerman, who along with James Warren a few years later, published Famous Monsters of Filmland. In 1947, Andre Norton had her novelette, The People of the Creator, published by Fantasy Publishing in the magazine Fantasy Book under another of her pen names, Andrew North. Perhaps the murder of the Black Dahlia in January of 1947 
was too soon for the killer to see the cover, but were there employees who may have and thought, merman, mermaid? Here are some of Fantasy Publishing's other covers and authors as the 1940s turned into the 1950s. And then Hollywood. Were there any mermaid movies in the works at the time? In 1946, a movie called Mr. Peabody and the Mermaid was in pre-production by the writer Nunnally Johnson. The newspapers across the United States ran a humor piece about his searching for a mermaid to play the part. Filming got underway in 47 at the new Wikiwachi Springs in Florida and it starred William Powell as an unfulfilled husband and Anne Blythe as the mermaid. Her character did not have dialogue. Did anyone in or outside the studio take an unusual interest in the production, particularly the lower half rubber mermaid suit created with a lot of trial and error by Wally Westmore? Aside from that movie, do any mermaid short films or pinups or bars have any connection? More importantly, was anyone arrested for stealing mermaid art, props, or statuary? Anyone arrested for stalking a woman who performed or appeared in a mermaid fantasy production? A living mermaid, even if only in tableau, would have driven our suspect crazy. Are there records of veterans, hospital workers, morgue workers, or sex offenders who may have suddenly left the area or committed suicide in the months after the murder? How about those who worked in the animal products or fish processing industry who disappeared or were institutionalized? Somewhere there was a guy with perversions and fetishes so strong that he did the things that were done to the body someone never before named in the case, who may have died and left behind some interesting materials. Most of the time after a death, the family or a landlord will throw away journals, artwork, sex books, and magazines of a man considered perverse. But still there is a chance that links to the offender are stored and available to be seen for what they are. All we can do is try. We can try and reevaluate this case with new theories, ideas, insights, odd news reports, and psychiatric records that may shed light and bring justice to Elizabeth Short, who was so cruelly used at the whims of a beast. We call her the Black Dahlia, and that will never change. Yet what she really was, was the saddest and most horribly memorialized mermaid ever conceived of by a monster. Thank you for your time, and if you wouldn't mind leaving a like on one of the cards on your table, I would appreciate it.